Welcome to the Explorers. Time traveling through history, one era at a time. I'm Kate Armstrong. Happy New Year, listeners! I hope you've had a great start to 2024. We've got just two more episodes to go in Season 4, in which we'll spend time with some of the 1920s glamorous silent film stars and jazz singers. But before we go there, I've got a special interview for you. I spoke to professor and author Elizabeth Cobbs about her book, Fearless Women, Feminist Patriots from Abigail Adams to Beyonce. Elizabeth's book gives us a panoramic look at the fight for women's rights in America, from the right to vote, sit on a jury, control the timing of their pregnancies, enjoy equal partnerships, and earn a living for themselves. She joined me to talk about the history of feminism in America, and to dive into what rights women really had in the 1920s, and which ones they were still struggling to grasp. Let's go traveling. But first, a shout out to some of my patrons. My newest pirate queens, Allie with a Y, Allie with an IE, Mary, J. Anthony, and Perry. My newest lady presidents, Victoria and Christina. My newest boss ladies, Miranda, Cayenne, Raven, and Leia. My warrior queens, two lovely Alexises, Amanda, Kate, Chelsea, Ika, Jessica, June, Neven Sloan, Samantha, and Sarah. My Imperial Empresses, Alyssa, Bridget, Faye and Whimsy Soapworks, Katie, Samara, and Teresa. And my Lady Pharaohs, Lori, Kimberly, Sophie, Laura, Kate, Cot, Cheryl, and the fabulous Courtney's. This show just wouldn't be possible without the generous support of all my patrons. For just a couple bucks a month, they each get episodes early and completely ad-free. Exclusive bonus episodes, discounts on merchandise, full interviews with guests, and more. To find out all about it, just go to my website, theexplorespodcast.com. Hello, Elizabeth, and welcome to The Exploress. Thank you so much, Kate. I'm really happy to be here. I'm thrilled to have you. You've written a truly fascinating book in Fearless Women. So I was hoping that you could start by pitching the book for us, just telling us a little bit about what the book is about before we get into it. Oh, that's curious. I've never been asked for my elevator speech before. <laughs> <laughs> I get asked so, for one all the time. So now I'm inflicting time, yeah. it upon you. Inflicting it. Um, well, I think the book is about kind of how we got here in the United States when the revolution happened. I mean, we start out with a, a king as the head of state. And today we have Kamala Harris, uh, a woman of color, as the vice president of the United States. So in a Republican government and one in which a, a woman plays such a key role. And I think just take all of that for granted. And we think, oh, yeah, somehow, tickety-boo, we went along and Susan B. Anthony, and here we are. And I really wanted to understand for myself kind of what were the steps. And so I think this book really does that. It really shows how each generation moved the marker, did something that nobody expected at the time that seemed craziness, like maybe you should be able to wear pants. You know, like, <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Oh, gosh, please, never that. Or, I mean, that's a trivial example, but there's, or like, how about if you earn wages, you get to keep them. They're not your husband's property. What if we do that? And so the, those are the kind of changes that happened over time. And I, I really wanted us all to, to see it and appreciate it and, and embrace it. Mm. And it is an interesting thing when you're talking about women's history and the different milestones and markers we saw along the way, something like wearing pants. There was no one year or one era in which a group of women said, that's it, we're wearing pants now, it's happening. And then women started wearing pants, right? It's History isn't clean like that. It's a, it's a progression. And as you say, every era helped to build on what the the women before, the, the generation before had worked to achieve and it's messy. And so I, I'm so interested in what you've done, this incredibly, I think, ambitious book and the way you put it together is so fascinating. So I'm really excited to get into it. But I wanted to start first by talking about the book's prologue. So one of the things that you talk about in the prologue is how controversial and almost divisive the word feminist can be. I think it's the the very opening of the prologue, you talk about how you have some colleagues 
who are all um, very intelligent women, leaders in their field, doing really interesting things, but none of them, they all say, oh, no, I'm not a, I'm not a feminist. I don't think of myself as a feminist. And that's something I've run into a lot, too, with people in my own life. So can you tell us why you think that is, how you've come to define the term feminist, and why you think it's important when it comes to especially America's history? Well, I think it's one of these words that's been allowed. So, you know, people like to you know hang on to a word and redefine it and say, oh, well, you know, that's what this means. And and the thing is, is that the word feminist is really our only global word for the global effort to promote gender equality. Now, by the way, that was, I think, maybe 10 words I just said, the global effort to promote gender equality or something. If you say feminist, what we're all talking about is that very thing. and. I think that it's really important, especially now when there's such a controversy worldwide, but also especially in the United States, about what are our values? Do we still believe in democracy, for for example? Do we mm. still believe in democracy? So if we do, it's really important to say, stand up and say, I believe in democracy. I believe in you know, one person, one vote, especially because there are people around the world like Xi Jinping in China or you know Putin or Orban in Germany, who are saying, oh, Western values, that's all passe, that's all stupid, and we all know that doesn't work. So feminism is this really, you know, protean value in a way in American history. I mean, as our Abigail Adams, who was the wife of John Adams, and the Adams household was kind of ground zero for the American Revolution. John Adams, you know, first vice president, but like big rabble rouser organizer of the American Revolution. And it's his wife who really starts the feminist ball rolling in the United States. So this is something that's for the United States is right, I mean, part of its history. And then, by the way, the ball, you know, come the French Revolution, and the ball rolls over to that side of the Atlantic. So, And then Mary Wollstonecraft comes in in England on the heels of the French Revolution. And so all of these things are really intimately connected. So, Kate, to answer your actual question, <laughs> <laughs> being a professor, I wander. But I like to use this um, definition that First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt gave, and she was the wife of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, you know, Great Depression and all that. And she wrote in 1935, the fundamental purpose of feminism is that women should have equal opportunity and equal rights with every other citizen. That's it. Bingo. So, you know, a number of first ladies have actually been a part of the feminist movement since Abigail Adams. Eleanor Roosevelt was a a very big feminist, um, very, you know, prominent. uh, So was, you know, Lady Bird Johnson and Rosalind Carter married to Jimmy Carter and Betty Ford, wife of President Ford in the, you know, late 20th century. So these has always been a part of the American dream. Now, by the way, of course, lots of opposition to that, including Mm -hmm. John Adams. (laughs) Oh, who, you yes. know, poo-pooed what his half- wife had to say. But over time, we've pretty much all of us come on board with it. And that's worldwide, if you look mm-hmm. at worldwide polls. So why do you think that there are so many people who are loath to claim the term? Because I do think there are a lot of people who will say, oh, no, 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 I'm not a feminist. That's not a label I'm willing to attach to myself. And I've always found that curious. Why do you think that is? Well, one reason is that... Um, in the United States, at least, uh, feminism came under attack in the seven, 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s as a part of the effort of some people on the far right in the United States, in the Republican Party, but to the right-hand side of the Republican Party, uh, who basically wanted to, they sort of, what happened is that feminism replaced communism as the boogeyman for at least mm-hmm. a time, you know, the boogeyman of communism goes away, Soviet Union falls, et cetera. So where does the know the sort of evangelical right now there are evangelicals who are on the left but the evangelical right they come down on it. feminism as this giant plot to kill the family and you know murder babies and you know etc etc and you know it's just uh it just became a part of the zeitgeist if you will um famous famous um american commentator uh, rush limbaugh who was uh, you know, big proponent of very conspiracy theories, etc. And he was one of the first people he coined the term feminazis and feminazis, meaning, you know, if you believe in equality between men and women, you must be 
a Nazi. Mm -hmm. Although they would sort of say, here's the weird part. They would actually, and this has been a trend in feminism throughout the 300, 250 years or whatever, is that people who are anti-feminists are often quasi-feminists because they'll say, oh, well, we approve of this and this and this, the things that came before. Like, okay, let's let women keep the vote. Or, you know, it's okay if women wear pants. And, you know, it's okay if a married woman is a school teacher. It's not going to corrupt the kids. So they'll accept the changes up to the point where they stand. And they'll say that any future reforms, however, are fanaticism. Mm -hmm. And then, by the way, there are, some, there are some also feminists on the left. I mean, I think we're all feminists, basically. But there are certainly some people on, on the left who want to in the same way that the right wants to push away the label, they want to grab the label as only theirs. And only if you agree to 25 other points on their platform, <laughs> do you get to call yourself a feminist? So it's, you know, it, it's, a, it's a dynamic, but I think it's, uh, it's harming us all. Yes, I agree. And the labels are interesting that way. I think the way... Um an identity, a word like feminism has picked up all these connotations over time. And I think one of them is that if you claim yourself as a feminist, it means that you're difficult. It means that you're angry. It means that you're troublesome. No one likes a troublesome lady. <laughs> well, even and now. That's, right. And actually, you know, your point there is sort of a broader one, which is, you know, how women perceive themselves and how you know, they think the world wants them to act. And so a woman who, you know, raises her voice assertively is more likely, not altogether, but is more likely to be seen as, you know, a, a difficult person. So that's why, uh, you know, there's this tendency of women sometimes when they talk to have their sentences go up at the end, like, I'm not sure I'm a really an expert. And so there, <laughs> this is a sort of vocal pattern where women, to some extent, tend to take a back seat to make it soften themselves so that, but it's kind of silly and it, it just feeds into this notion that we all just, you know, need to be second place. We need to, by the way, FYI, this goes to the Abigail Adams in the John Adams, Abigail Adams era, the era of the American revolution. It was the case that a woman was never supposed to speak in public and in, in, if there were men present. So let's say you and I go to a party or we have a reception at our house and uh, we invite, you know, our husbands, gentlemen, friends, whatever. You are then supposed to be silent from that point on. You're supposed to, if you speak, you don't speak, but you can make conversation with your eyes. So my eyes are saying, oh, I heard your question. And my eyes are saying, oh, aren't you smart? But you're not supposed to ever speak. So that, that sort of old way of women who speak up are considered gauche. That's very old. Very yes. Notion. And listeners who have listened to our episode on suffrage, which I re-released lately, um, I talk a little bit about Abigail Adams and about suffrage in America, but also the kinds of barriers that women were dealing with and how I find it fascinating that women like Abigail Adams, who were obviously so intelligent and so thoughtful, so well-read with lots of opinions couldn't, as you say, express them. It wasn't seen as ladylike to express them in public or even in private. Um, so she tried to appeal to her husband and to say, remember the ladies. Um, you know, I can't necessarily go and campaign for the ladies, but you can. And you are my, my partner in life. So would you please remember the ladies? And he said, oh, darling, <laughs> that would lead to chaos. Yeah, he said, I cannot but laugh. I cannot but laugh, you know, and she is so sweet and so supportive and does <laughs> so much to keep this whole train on track during the revolution. And, uh, you know, she's a partner of his, of his in the court of St. James and in, in London. I mean, she's, you know, she's a big part of the whole thing. Yeah. And, and he basically says, you know, you're disloyal. It's what we're talking about. It's like, you know, if you're even raising these questions, you know, kind of who are you? And so he pats her on the head. And actually, when she talks about anything else, he talks to her just like an equal. She asks, you know, how is it coming with the Declaration of Independence? And are the Southerners going to fight as hard as the Northerners because they already enslave people? Will they care about liberty like we do? So mm -hmm. any of those questions, he just answers her straight up. Well, yeah, this is what's going on, et cetera. 
but she asks about women and he immediately retreats into, oh, well, women wear the pants in the household anyway. And it's just, it's quite remarkable. And she, she is so distressed. She waits two weeks to write him back after his famously dis- dismissive letter. And she says, I waited two weeks because I was afraid that my pen would run away with me and I would utter some unbecoming invective. Unbecoming. In other words, she would call him out, but that's unbecoming. So she she waited a couple of weeks and then she'd still reamed him out a little bit. <laughs> She's like, how can you say this? It must have been very difficult for her to receive something like that from her partner in life. <laughs> yeah. And the, but like, you know, she loved him. You know, she really did. And he really loved her. So it's just that kind of conflict between two people, but where one person really has the power and will call the shots. And he tries to, you know, he tries to pass it off as a joke, but it's not. Yes. Okay. Well, let's talk about the book as a whole, because this is, these are some of the topics and questions that you're, you cover in the opening chapter. But I just want to stop for a minute and talk about how you went about structuring this book. So when you decided that you wanted to write a book about women in American history and the different gains they made and how they made them, there it's a huge, huge topic. And there's so many ways you could have approached it. And I'm so interested in how you decided to structure the book. So can you tell us a little bit about how you made those decisions and how you decided which women to highlight? Yeah, sure. You know, I wanted to write about this topic, but I didn't want it to be boring. Now, I know that sounds kind of odd, but if you get anything that's very broad, it tends to sound like a textbook. You know, it gets kind of a list of organizations and a list of laws and a few cameo appearances. And I really didn't want it to be like that. I wanted to, for myself first, but then for all my readers to read it and go, oh, wow, now I get it. And so what I did, there were kind of two major structural decisions I made early, one of which was that I wanted to, in each chapter, feature two people. So it's really like their stories, and you're kind of following them in their lives, like, oh, my God, what's going to happen next? Is Susan B. Anthony going to go to jail? You know, <laughs> And she was on trial. So that's the kind of thing I wanted to make it story, story-like. And so each chapter has a person who's the person you might expect, a kind of public figure who, um, you know, is somebody who is, I call the face of feminism, like, the, like Abigail Adams, somebody who's specifically thinking about this topic and doing something about it. And she's somebody who's kind of civic-minded, if you will. Somebody who says, you know, she cares about lots of topics, but she's very civic-minded and, she, you know, we've got we've to address this question. The second person in each chapter is somebody who I think helps us all of us understand what the stakes were. Because I think there's this tendency with feminism to say, oh, what's all the fuss about? You know, just, okay, you broke your fingernail. Okay, more equal pay. All right. What's, you know, how does that really, you know, affect anybody? And so each chapter has somebody who, when you read it, and people of the era, when they came to understand that this is what could happen, They themselves, even as conservative as they were 200 or 150 years or 100 years ago, would go, oh, well, wow, yeah, that's, you know, that's not right. And so changes in law were brought forward by women, but also sometimes by men who, I mean, after all, they were all the legislators. Nothing could change unless they agreed to it. And so there were men as well as women who could look upon these personal circumstances and go, yeah, we, you know, this isn't us. This isn't who we want to be. No, we do believe in dignity and uh, opportunity and fairness and justice for all. And so so that was really fun, you know, kind of. And then you have to think, you know, well, so who's the right face of feminism? You know, who's the right, um, you know, why we care kind of person? Yes, I'm just fascinated by how you structured it. And I think it works really well in helping the reader to understand what were the consequences, but also to show, as you say, the people of their era, men and women, to, to see the consequences of this is what happens. I, you know, my first season of the show was about mid 19th century Civil War era America. And one of the things that really struck me from that era, although there's some semblance of this in pretty much every era, 
was that there were a lot of women who didn't necessarily care about suffrage or didn't see the point of going out to vote because they said, well, my husband votes for me. He's the head of the family. He'll vote. He takes care of us. You know, he's he's the one who does the banking. He's the the public figure of the family. And I'm, you know, the domestic figure. And that works. And it's interesting because I think many of the women who were of that mind were women with money, women with security. And a lot of them were women whose husbands they could hold accountable. But what about all the women who were single, whose husbands left them, who were in a, in a position where what happens basically when the ideal can't be reached? What happens when the ideal goes wrong? What happens to the women who aren't in those situations? They're in danger. They're vulnerable in so many ways. And so I think we see, you really show that in your book. Every single chapter you see, what are the consequences for the women who find themselves in difficult situations? And I thought that that was really moving. Well, the, yeah, and that's, and I think that's exactly right, Kate. It's, most of us don't think of, you know, 99% of the time, what are my rights in this situation? You know, we only think about our rights when you feel, you know, there's an injustice or there's something that makes your life impossible to live. And then all of us go, oh, well, what are that person's rights? And, and so, you know, if you have a, you know, a wonderful husband, if you have, you know, economic security, if you have good health, you know, there's lots of reasons why it would not be an issue at all. Um, but let me give you an example from the mid-19th century in this chapter, which features Susan B. Anthony and the face, that kind of the face of feminism and the Why We Care woman is a woman named Elizabeth Packard. And both Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Packard separately came up against an issue that neither of them had ever given any thought to. Um, for Susan B. Anthony, what happened is that she was visiting a friend and she was in a, a shop and a woman came in and heavily veiled. Veils were very common in the 19th century. But um, this woman comes in and she says, my husband has thrown me into an insane asylum and I now I'm out, but I really, I want to see my kids but he's blocking all access to my kids. My youngest is my only daughter. So I've kidnapped my own daughter and I'm trying to flee. Now it's all against the law. Her husband has total custody rights to the children. Women have no custodial rights over their own biological children. And also, you know, so she's kidnapping. And Susan B. Anthony comes to her aid. And separately, a di totally different woman in a different part of the U.S. and um, in Illinois has a great marriage six kids. And then one day, you know, she's sassing her husband about this or that. He's a preacher and she has different ideas about religion. And he feels very like threatened by that. And he puts her, yes, like Susan B. Anthony's friend, into an insane asylum for life. So you can be committed by your husband. By the way, a woman cannot commit her husband. A man can commit his wife. That's the inequality of it. And uh, once you are committed, you have no right to correspondence with the outside. You have no right to an attorney. And you have no right to questioning by a panel of doctors who might decide if you actually are crazy or not. All it takes is your husband saying, my wife, you know, my crazy wife. Well, she is crazy. And so this woman, Elizabeth Packard, suddenly says, well, what are my rights? And her right, she has none. Because under the laws of what were called coverture, women were covered by their husband's legal status. They actually had no legal existence. I know that sounds weird. How's that possible? You're like, are you sure about that? Are you? <laughs> I'm like, oh. yeah, I'm really double, double check that one, Kate. Um, mm -hmm. So she had no rights. And so, you know, I, I don't want to tell you too much of the story because it's all about how she gets out of the insane mm -hmm. asylum and what she does with that and how she ends up campaigning to change the laws. She's that she never amazing thought of. Woman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's not like she ever thought, oh gosh, I guess I'm a feminist now. Let me go out there and see what laws might not be fair. It's just when it hits you, mm -hmm. it hits your family or hits your friend, and you go, are you kidding me? And yes. no, no kidding. That's right. And I think, as you say, it's it's easy to say this law doesn't impact me or I don't need to think about my legal rights, it all seems to be working fine. But then someone like Elizabeth Packard, who suffered such a horrifying thing to be committed, not because she was difficult, 
by a husband who was frustrated by what he saw as disobedience and just what she had to go through, the separation from her. I mean, it, it is a harrowing and fascinating story, but we see that running theme throughout your book of, well, <laughs> this does, this seems all theoretical until we actually look at a woman who had to suffer under this particular inequality and just to see her story and see what she had to grapple with. It's yeah, I spent a lot of time reading about women in history, so I I don't have to double check any of your facts. They sound outrageous. It's I can't tell you the number of times, the amount of time I spend reading about women's legal rights throughout history and going, that can't be right. Is that right? Really? Well, it's like <laughs> it's like women in Afghanistan today, and you go, oh wait a minute, you mean they can't go to school past sixth grade now? They can't go to university now? They can't go to work at the UN, which is the most one of the more recent things that happened. Um, and so what we see there is an interesting situation because we're seeing the walking backwards. And what my story is trying to show you is the walking forwards. To us, it's these things are surprising because we think the world has always been more or less like it is now. But actually, women in the United States and in most of the world in 1776 were like women living in Afghanistan today. Mm. Oh, that's food for thought. <laughs> okay, so we could. There are so many things in your book that we could talk about. We could talk about it forever. There's just so much to chew on. But I want to focus in and around the 1920s in America, both because that's where my listeners are time traveling at the moment, but also because I think we often think of the 1920s as a time of real liberation for women, and in some ways it was. But I think most listeners will be surprised as the season goes on to find out how, <laughs> as much as we want to believe the freewheeling flapper who could vote and drink and do what she wanted, it sounds very sexy. But women were, especially women, non women of color, were struggling for equality in many, many ways. And there were there were a lot of things they were grappling with. So can you tell us a little bit about? America and women's rights in the 1920s and some of the some of the rights they had gained but also some of the rights they were the issues they were still grappling with in terms of equality. Well, you know, when women get the vote, which of course takes 70 years. <laughs> By the way, so Abigail Adams dipping back one second, she <laughs> raises and Adams himself says he says to another man in May of 1776, well before July 4th, he says, be careful, sir, because if you go too far, depend upon it, women will ask for the vote. So he says this in 1776. And it's not for another 150 years that women actually get the vote. So it's not like this was some crazy cooked up idea that these wild women had. No, it's the logic of the American Revolution from day one. So in the 1920s, you do have this thing where suddenly people think, oh, I guess that's it. You know, tut, 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 we're done. We, we're, it's all over with now. We don't need to worry about this. So by the way, I thought one of the funny things I discovered writing this was that when women got the vote, there was this big celebration in the U.S. Senate, and there was this big statue that was commissioned of a bust of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott and Susan B. Anthony. And it was going to be sit in the rotunda, the capital, national capital, because there were no no women in this gallery of, of statues. They were all men. And so they're like, oh, let's let's have one of, a, of some women, right? So they put it up. Awesome, awesome. You know, they go and they put roses. There are speeches. The next day, somebody in the dead of night takes the statue and moves it down. I don't even know how they got it down the stairs, down to the basement of the rotunda and scratched out the inscription because it talked about who these women were, that it, this was this great revolution and women's rights. Scratch out the inscription and put it down where they kept the mops and the buckets. Oh and there it sat until the 1990s. Wow. So there was this <laughs> so it was the this 1990s. sense of, Oof. it's sort of like, yeah, you can have your vote. Are we going to celebrate it? Nah. So it was kind of this interesting thing. So women, there weren't a lot of, in the 20s, there were still some sort of things people said, well, you know, let's see if we can get this passed. So one of the things that they did get passed in the 1920s was a new law, which said, now hold on your hats here, that if you marry a foreigner, you don't cease to be a United States citizen. Because that was the law. Remember, you're covered by your husband. Your husband's identity 
is your identity. So if you married, by the way, this happened most prominently to the daughter of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who married a Brit. She married an Englishman. And from the day of her marriage, she was no longer an American citizen until, you know, in the 1920s, they passed what was called the Cable Act. So there are these sort of mop up sorts of things that people were concerned of, concerned with. But I mean, there's just so many things, Kate, that weren't available to women. For example, this notion that if you, um, if you work and you earn wages, they belong to you. And that actually was something that, you know, was still being worked out. And there were 50 states, or at that time, not 50 at the time, but, you know, can't remember the exact number in 1922 or whatever. But, um, you know, what was happening is every state would have its own laws. But in some states, you know, if you worked, uh, you didn't get to keep your wages. Now, by the way, some states like New York said, oh, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, you can keep your wages. Um, they passed a law saying that. And how the judges interpreted that law was, well, yeah, you can if you have your husband's permission. So what does that mean? <laughs> Again, it's not a right. It's a privilege. And so often that's why women's lives were structured. If my husband gives me the privilege of reading this book, if my husband gives me the privilege of going out at night, if my husband gives me the privilege of working. And if he doesn't say no wife of mine is going to work. I mean, if these are all privileges rather than rights. And so that's the sort of thing that really occupies women's attention in the 1920s, 1930s. Mm. Yes, it's so interesting that it's a privilege, not a right. You can see why so many younger women in the 1920s were not uh, running to the altar to get married. <laughs> well, um, and it's a funny thing. I think that pe when people are sold to the idea that they're being given a privilege, it makes you think, oh, I'm special, right? I'm special because I get a privilege. That sounds like something fun. Right. <laughs> I'm going to get the privilege of going to the White House tomorrow night, you know, whatever. Um, and so I think that's one of the ways that women were sort of, you know, tricked into or thought of themselves and actually really probably were tricked because some some men were quite conscious about this, you know, shower a woman with these privileges. And she said, well, I don't want to give away my privileges. If I give I if I get rights in exchange for privileges, well, which which sounds more fun? You know, privileges sounds more fun, but they're just the problem is that you're very vulnerable, as you said. You know, if you've got a, a great guy who wants to shower you with privileges, maybe you have a great guy who's, um, you know, who's poor. Maybe you have a great guy who's ill. Maybe you have a great guy who dies. So it doesn't even depend on your spouse or your partner. It's, it's where you stand in the society. That's exactly right. Okay, so let's talk about some of the specific women that you cover in the chapters that are hovering around the 1920s, just before and then into that era. So there is a chapter where you talk a lot about suffrage, and you talk a bit about reproductive rights and education for women. So I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit about Mary Church Terrell and Rosa Cavalieri. <laughs> uh, my two women from that era. Yeah, Mary Church Turrell was a um, a black suffragist. And, you know, I think one of the ways that feminine people run down feminism, again, there's sort of these myths about feminism. On the right, there's this idea that it's a bunch of man-hating cranks, you know, nags. Um, on the left, there's this idea often that's put, but feminists are racist and they're transphobic and they're just old-fashioned. And both of these are criticisms that, again, just serve to divide us. And they're also just incredibly not true as well. That's the funny thing. Like, there's just so much evidence. They're just untrue. So Mary Church Turrell is a black suffragist, and she marches on the U.S. White House and is solicited to come do so by Alice Paul, who is you know, one of the most prominent American suffragists. Um, and she you know, is a very uh, you know, good friend of Susan B. Anthony. It's Susan B. Anthony who actually kind of promotes her career. Susan B. Anthony is the preceding generation is quite old, by, elderly by the time she meets Mary Church Turrell. But Mary Church Turrell is like this amazing phenomenon. She's a fantastic speaker, speaker and she's black. And um, so she's part of this really awkward and difficult moment in American feminism where they're trying to get the vote, but the vote gets snagged by and hung up on issues of race. Now, by the way, not because, yes, there were some feminists who were racist, happy to tell you about them. Uh, obviously, that's true in any big group of people. There are going to be people who have lots of different values. But um, 
In this case, the feminists had always put forward the leading organizations that the vote would be for all women, period, all women of voting age. And there were very prominent groups of segregationists. This was the era of Jim Crow in the United States, where Jim Crow really sinks his teeth in um, you know, to the American politic. And, and so what happens is they say, well, we're happy to give women the vote as long as it's only white women. Or how about, how about this? We will give women the vote as long as we can trade it for black suffrage. We can get rid of the 15th Amendment, which gave the vote to black men, only men. And we'll trade that for a new amendment for just white women. So these are the kind of obstacles. And so Mary Church Turnall is this really interesting and, by the way, incredibly beautiful and highly, highly educated woman, educated in the U.S. and in Europe, you know, in America. And she's in this really interesting position because black women are right in there in the fray of all of this. They're doing stuff the whole time. That's why I just say feminism was just a bunch of racist whites. It's like totally undersells all the thing that the Black women, women of color, to various groups were doing. Um, but she also has to, she's also aware. She, in fact, she says later in her memoir, she said, I met every president during my lifetime. By the way, she goes back to the right after the American Civil War. I mean, she, she met James Garfield, you know. She, um, she says, you know, I met every American president through President Truman, except for Woodrow Wilson. Because it was Woodrow Wilson who was reinstigating, who was instigating Jim Crow in the national capital at the same time, by the way, that he was promoting suffrage for all women. So it's kind of a, it's a big tangle, but she was great. She was, and then she becomes, you know, a politician in the twenties and she's traveling up and down the Eastern seaboard, getting uh, black women primarily to vote. She says, you know, by God, I can't believe we, by some miracle, she says, by some miracle, after 70 years, we have the vote and you've got to go use it. So that's what she's doing in the 20s. Um, Rosa Cavallari, she's like all of the, you know, like so many millions of people worldwide in the, you know, who are, you know, tr- you know, immigrating in this period to the United States, to Australia, to South America, you know, all over the world. And she's one of this giant wave of Italians who comes in, but she's she's uh, in, a, in an arranged marriage. And it's like it's that's the old world. She comes from the old world. And this arranged marriage to a man who's very brutal, uh, just really, really physically brutal and just just awful, awful person. And uh, so what's interesting there, the kind of fun thing, two things about that chapter is what happens when you go from one culture, kind of what we'll call an old world culture, you know, into the new world. Um, Yeah, everyone uses those terms. Um, And she's like, well, wow, this is really different. Like, I can I can talk to people in a store. By the way, that was like a big deal to her. The store people would talk to her as if she was their equal, and it just blew her mind. So she sees in America kinds of equality that she never found in her old village in Lombardy and near Milan that just sort of shake her world up altogether. But then she also realizes that being a woman in America is also really different from being a woman in Italy. So parts of the old world come with her in this arranged marriage. But she gets here and she discovers that women don't just have to be beaten. Whereas in Italy, that's just unquestioned. There's just no question that you will be everybody. Every man beats his wife. It's expected. And here she starts to realize it's different. The other thing about her story I thought was so interesting is that like so many of the women in this book, um, you know, I was just surprised. I wasn't looking for it. But you just see in life after life how reproductive issues just so dramatically affect lifespan. I mean, Mary Wollstonecraft dies in childbirth, the famous author of Vindication of the Rights of Women, dies in childbirth. Um, a, a lot, many of the women I studied, uh, you know, had lost one or two children, had almost lost their own lives. In fact, Mary Church Turrell almost dies uh, uh, in childbirth. So this thing about having any control over your reproductive know cycle is so fundamental and so this is the period also the 20s teens and 20s where Planned Parenthood is invented by Margaret Sanger uh, and where the idea is that maybe it's okay to talk about these things because that's what Rosa Cavallari never knew I mean she was told when she was a girl um, you know they were saying well you know there there are things that the man does to the woman when you get married and she'd say, what things? And like, oh, you can't ask that question. 
only the man is supposed to tell the woman what happens when they get married. So she's completely ignorant. She gets pregnant. She doesn't yet know how does the baby get out. Because, by the way, the man's not there to tell her at this moment. Maybe he doesn't know. Who knows? And she, she is so woefully ignorant that, and it just it puts her life in danger again and again and again. And when she comes to America, she also still thinks that you can't talk about reproduction unless you're talking to a woman who's also married and had kids. That's allowed. But to talk to an unmarried woman about reproduction, never, never. Because, well, she's unmarried. The husband hasn't told her yet what happens. Mm -hmm. So, and it's because of that that she almost dies, but she's saved by feminists <laughs> in the mm -hmm. settlement house movement. Um, women who. Oh, it's such really a moving story. She's... Yeah, it's I such know. a moving, it's such a it's, moving story. It's this such a little break woman. your heart thing. Like the mm -hmm. letters to Margaret Sanger from women who say, you know, I had my first baby when I was 12. And I have 11 children now, and I don't know what to do. I, 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 will, I will literally die. if I, My doctors told me I will die if I have another child. What can I do? And so it's just that suffering and, and the hopefulness. It's, it's people suffer. And in this very hopeful, loving you know, way, we move forward and we try to bring others with us. Yes. And it, I thought it was really touching how... Rosa was so grateful to the women, those feminists who helped her all her life. And she tried to reach back and help others like her who were really at the mercy of their husbands. And in this case, her husband is truly, her first husband is truly just awful. He's abusive in every sense. And she is so ignorant that that ignorance means that she has so few choices and so little agency and you just feel for her. And I loved knowing that in her hour, one of her hours of need, that there were women there to help her and to get her what she needed. But it is, it's, it's harrowing, especially because of the era that she is living in. Again, this is not like the 1770s. This is, you know, this is turn of the century. This is going into the 1920s. It's sort of the, the era right before that. Where you just you know that these things happen to women, but I think we would rather dwell on all of the gains rather than all of the dangers and all of the the ways that women were still being having agency taken away from them. So I found that incredibly moving. And obviously, the 1920s, as you say, is a really interesting time for reproductive rights and that shifting conversation that was so radical at the time of maybe it's okay to talk about where babies come from. Maybe it's okay to give women, I don't know, some agency over how many children they have. Um, something I have found in all of my research in American history is that so many of the women who sought out abortions and sought out family planning resources were married women who already had several kids and said, I really can't have any more for various reasons, health reasons, financial, all, you know, so many reasons and were desperate and they just wanted to be able to make some choices. I, yeah. They wanted to, they wanted to do that thing that presumably all of us have is the right to save our own life. You know, the right of self-preservation and um, Margaret Sanger, you know, famously always tells the story that you know, she was trained as a nurse. Her mother died young, had a, you know, I can't remember, you know, a dozen kids or something and died young, you know, very, very, her health compromised. But Margaret Sanger had seen a, a woman die of an, a botched abortion. And, and it happened because the woman's doctor had said to her, you cannot have any more children or you will die, uh, you know, for whatever those health reasons were. So, you know, the woman, but he said, I cannot prescribe pres any birth control because it's illegal. Birth control is illegal. And um, we tend to forget that birth control in the United States, at least, doesn't become legal nationwide until 1965, seven years before abortion becomes legal, which, of course, has now been reversed. But that connection between birth control and abortion, they are, you know, extensions of each other. The idea of, you know, in extremis, how do you control birth? How do you plan or space births? For what reasons? And of course, now there are states here in the United States which say, no, the woman must die. We will withhold. I mean, this came out in debates recently. It was Idaho saying, no, no, we do. Yeah, we understand that some women will die from this because the doctor can't do life-saving measures. 
they would they will have to be denied to a woman. Um, so Margaret Sanger, you know, saw this woman and said, this is just craziness. And she, by the way, um, you know, again, abortion wasn't something that she was uh, providing at all. She was just providing uh, pamphlets on how do you space children? You know, what kinds of prophylactic devices might you be able to use, which were all illegal, by the way, you couldn't, you know, mail condoms, you couldn't mail information even on birth control. So that's why she, you know, she did go to jail and so did her sister. Um, so really simple things. And as you said, it's just because you know, almost all of these were married women, by the way. I mean, most women married. <laughs> and those are the people who were having seven, eight, nine, ten kids. Yes. Yeah, it's an interesting perception that the women who are seeking out family planning are, and now, but certainly in the 20s, were those freewheeling women who were going out and drinking in bars and driving in cars with boys, you know, all of that. And, you know, they're the ones, it's like such a danger. We're allowing these women to be wild and to have premarital sex when, yes, <laughs> a lot of the yeah, women no, who I needed that, the support were actually married. Yeah, you know, I think there's that idea of like girls getting themselves into trouble. Mm -hmm. Right. Girls getting mm -hmm. themselves into trouble. Like they had no help with this, by the way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, right. and so there is, I, I do think that in a very fundamental way, there is this effort. To, it's a desire to control women even more than it is a desire to promote population growth. You know, let's have as many babies as we can and save as many you know, fetuses as we can. It really is about, you know, those women, they should have just watched out better. And, and A, it's never just them. <laughs> has never once happened that a person got pregnant all by themselves. So, you know, but it's it's the woman who has to suffer. Yes. Ah, true in the 1920s, true now. But before we, <laughs> we could keep talking about that, but I want to make sure that we talk about your chapter titled The Right to Earn, because I do think the 1920s, 1930s is a really interesting time where we see women in America, more women working, more women living alone or living in boarding houses. But at the same time, there were some financial freedoms, but a lot of women couldn't open a bank account without a man. She didn't have full control over her wages always. There's just, it's a really interesting time from that perspective. So I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit about that chapter and specifically if you can introduce us to Francis and Anne. Oh, Francis and Anne, my darlings. Um, <laughs> well, so here's the funny thing. If you were unmarried, you kept many of your rights. But if you got married, marriage was a trigger for losing your rights as a woman. And which is so sad in a way. I, mean, I think in some ways I like to say feminism deserves some credit for promoting romantic love, uh, you know, in the United States, because women said, you know, you should be able to marry for love, not for a, you know, a meal, it's not a meal ticket. A man should marry for love, not to just get a servant, you know, and a sex partner. Uh, and so if you allow both people to be full people and retain their rights, then, you know, you can have equality in marriage will promote actually a better marriage, a more loving marriage. And so what happens, uh, Frances Perkins and Anne-Marie Reeb, she, so Frances Perkins is, she's my face of feminism. She's the one that people know about, or many people would. Uh, she was the first woman to sit in a presidential cabinet. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt appointed her the secretary of labor, which um, was kind of a controversial position because labor sounds like men, you know, he man. And so in fact, all the unions were just totally, you know, totally, you know, upset. Like, you know, I, I guess we're going to have to start wearing lipstick and parades. and We better get out our powder puffs when we go to work now. I mean, just all kinds of stuff like that. And um, but she turned out to be probably the most important secretary of labor the United States has ever had. And also one of the most influential, important women worldwide in the first half of the 20th century, because she's the person who said, who goes to Roosevelt and says, well, I don't want this job, A. But B, if I take it, I'll only take it if you'll allow me to fight for three things. Universal, uh, uh, I want a minimum wage, minimum wage. We want social security in insurance so people can retire and not depend on their children or starve. And I want there to be unemployment insurance. Now, these are very fundamental things that everyone takes for granted today in the United States. 
Um, and Roosevelt thought she couldn't do it. He said, I have no idea how you're going to get that one, any of that through. But Francis, if you want to do that, you know, you go. Because um, he really, she had been his secretary of labor when he was governor of New York. And he saw what she did, knew she was fantastic. And so it's really because of Francis Perkins that we have what are considered to today the most important um, aspects of the New Deal, the, almost the only aspects of the New Deal that really persist through the present. Um, and so she's just this amazing individual. And she does it a great personal sacrifice, by the way. Again, she's not a pushy, you know, cranky, difficult person, you know, elbowing her way in at all. Um, her husband is mentally ill, actually. She's the sole support of her family. So the whole happy dream of, you know, you go home and your husband takes care of you for the rest of your life was not something she had. You know, she expected that, but then he became ill and that was that was gone. And they had a child who was kind of an emotional teenager and there was a concern like, well, gosh, is she going to develop the same mental problems as my husband does? So she didn't want that job, but it was really a patriotic thing for her to do. She felt like if her president was asking her in the depths of the Great Depression to do this, of course she would. And in fact, she served with him through his four terms. He died in the middle of his the beginning of his fourth term, but you know, through four terms. And she offer, offered him her resignation like three times. And he kept saying, no, Francis, Francis, I can't lose you. I can't lose you. And she becomes one of the longest serving cabinet secretaries in all of American history. So that's her. And then the other person is Anne. And Anne is a cowgirl. <laughs> Anne's a rancher. Anne lives in North Dakota and she can rope a steer and, you know, bake a pie. And, you know, she does it all. <laughs> that's the crazy thing about her. She does all the guys stuff. She does all the girls stuff. She's, you know, a very well-rounded individual. And the only thing that really irritates her is when women try to get out of work by pretending that they don't, that they can't do it. You know, she has a younger sister who is just always skating by, you know, because she doesn't want to have to do the hard physical labor. And that just, that does irritate Anne. But she's just this lovely, lovely person. And here's her problem. It's the Great Depression. Money is really, really tight. And if you have a job, oh my gosh, the last thing you want to do is give up your job. Um, she knows if she marries, she's a school teacher, she will be fired immediately by the policies of every school district in America at the time. So she will lose her income if she marries. Now, by the way, wouldn't it be lovely if some charming prince comes along who's just a great guy and like he's got a lot of money? Well, first of all, if she is asked to be married. I mean, about seven men ask her to marry them. You know, most of them are just as broke as she is, you know, and they're just scraping by. In fact, a couple of guys say, I really want to marry, want you, want to marry you, but I have to wait until my two younger brothers graduate high school because I'm still supporting them because my mom's a widow and she needs my income. So everybody's in a fix. And uh, eventually the depression, you know, it just gets harder and harder and she has to make a choice. And that's why you need to read the book. That's right. Find out what happens. Yeah, I, I, I just love the women that you feature in this book, both the well-known and the lesser known, all have such interesting stories that are fascinating to follow along with and to see how they... Even the women who never meet and whose paths never cross, by putting them side by side, the way their stories weave together, it just makes for such a compelling read. And I think that my listeners are really going to love it. But before I let you go, I have to ask you one more question, which I ask all my guests. And it is this. If you could go time traveling to any time and place and spend the day there, where would you go? One day. Well, when I was a girl, I used to always think it would be the Wild West, because I guess I have a kind of a little bit of Anne Marie Reeb in me. <laughs> I'd like to be the cowgirl. Um, and I think now, gosh, as long as you could go back and not get a really bad disease, you know, I don't know. I, you know, uh, gosh, you know, I'd love to see a play at the Old Globe and see Will Shakespeare on stage. But, but That's a good neat? one. That's a good one. Yeah, that would be amazing. I'll happily go with you on that time traveling excursion. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us, Elizabeth. This has been fascinating. And I really hope my listeners will go out and pick up a copy of Fearless Women so they can uh, find out what happens to Anne and all the other fascinating figures in your book. Thank you so much, Kate. Thank 
Thanks for listening. You can buy Elizabeth's book, Fearless Women, right now. If you like The Explorers, tell a friend about it, leave a review wherever you listen, become a patron of the show, or just shoot me an email telling me what you love about it. Much love to Carly Quinn for all her help putting together The Explorers. You can find show notes at my website, theexplorespodcast.com, and you can find me on Instagram at theexplorespodcast. And don't forget, I have a merch store at that website where you can get Explorers t-shirts, specially designed maps and timelines, all sorts of lady-centric goodness. Until next time. Mm-hmm.